Kia ora koutou everyone. We'll kick off um, seeing we've just tipped over quarter to four. Um, there'll be a few more people popping on, I'm sure. Um, so kia ora koutou. I'm Fiona McDonald and I'm coming to you today uh, as the EOTC support and lead for EONS. And we're going to look at sports, uh, school sports safety management systems. Uh, so um, starting with just a few um, overall um, housekeeping matters. Um, if you stay on mute uh, most of the time, that'd be great. Um, questions can pop into the chat and I'll try and pick those up along the way. Um, and I'll also have some breaks for um, questions as we work through the session and definitely um, a chance at the end as well um, for any questions that come up. Uh, before we kick off, just a plug for the National EOTC Coordinated Database. Um, you've probably come um, through that database to this session today, but we really need your help in um, getting all your neighboring schools involved. Um, we're around a thousand schools on that database. And so we've got about 1,500 to go. Um, and it just allows uh, great direct conversations with schools and making sure that you are all getting timely information on all things EOTC. So if you're talking to your neighbourhood school or in your networks, um, if you can uh, check that they know about uh, the EOTC database, it's greatly appreciated. Uh, key arching, or overarching key messages for the whole of this Zoom series um, have been around meeting good practice and what that actually means uh, for schools. Uh, so key, three things. Um, understanding the procedures you're using and why you're using those procedures. Making sure your, the tools that you're using are either the current tools sitting on the um, EOTC, or, yeah, the EOTC um, section in TKI or on the EONS website, or that the, the tools you are using do the same job as them. And uh, probably most importantly of all, ensuring everyone involved really understands um, what's involved in the activity and can competently inter, um, run the activity, as well as deal with any emergency situations that come up during the activity. So those are some really key points for making sure that you're meeting good practice. So talking about school sport and where does that sit? Um, so page one of the EOTC guidelines um, make it very clear that EOTC includes sport and therefore um, needs to have the same level uh, of consideration given to it as any EOTC in your school um, and matching or similar systems in place. And those are the, some of the things we're gonna talk about today, what those systems can look, about, look like and how to gain some efficiencies in those systems. So when we look at a school sports pro program, it can really be split into two main streams that require a bit of a different approach to planning. Uh, first one is the one-off events or tournaments, sports exchanges, um, those regional and national competitions Often um, in some of those, it's just one or two kids and they might be going with a parent um, to those events. And so they require a more individual approach to planning and approval. Um, they're often quite big events as well if you're talking about tournament weeks and sports exchanges with other schools. Uh, so it's more like planning uh, your camp event and involves more individual tailored responses. The other stream that we'll talk more about today because I think that's where you can gain some real efficiencies is the weekly competitions. And a lot of the material in there can be standardized to cover the season of that competition in that particular code. Um, so that's things like the, down here in Christchurch we have Wednesday sport, involves thousands of students across Christchurch schools. Uh, Friday night basketball, um, the seasons for the co winter codes and summer codes that happen on the weekend. 
those types of um, sports that run across a period of time. So looking first at a top governance level um, and around health and the Health and Safety at Work Act, um, the school's responsibilities apply to the coaches and managers, whether they're volunteer coaches or managers or paid or they're your own staff um, taking responsibility for those teams. And part of that is around that they need to be inducted and trained so they know what their responsibilities are. And that that induction and training should be documented. And we'll flick out now um, from this screen and look at the form four in the EOTC toolkit, which is a good starting point if um, you're looking for a document to capture that information on. And so I'm just gonna swap, uh, stop sharing this one and pop into a different screen. So now hopefully you can all see the template for Form 4, uh, which is the EOTC Volunteer Assistant Agreement Form. And the sports coordinator can pick this up and modify it so that they're capturing the information from uh, volunteer coaches and managers that they're using um, across their sports program. So there's lots of things in here that can be modified to make it look like a sports form, um, you know, getting rid of three of the words out of the title to start with. Um, if it hasn't got swimming, you know, deleting that uh, swimming um, category. Just working through the form and making it meet your needs. Um, but key is down in this part around what you're asking of your volunteer coach or manager. And obviously you can change that lead in sentence. And some good additions into here, uh, asking um, for them to tick, that they understand um, and are willing to take on the role they've been asked to. So that implies that they've um, been well briefed on what that role actually is and that they add and another tick box can be that they understand the school's expectations of them. Um, so that you've talked them through what the school is expecting and they understand that and have had a chance to ask questions. Um, and so you can modify this bit to match that. When you're using, or if you decide to use a form like this to keep a record that you've done some induction and training, then you would add down the bottom a tick box for whoever is doing that induction and training. Um, in this case, it's probably likely to be the sports coordinator. And um, you could just have a tick box that said the role has been discussed and accepted and any relevant training has been provided. The sports coordinator signs and dates that as well, gets filed away and you have a record that that conversation has taken place. So I'll just swap back. If you've got any questions, now's a great time on what we've talked about so far. So feel free to come off mute at any stage and ask questions. You know that if you've got one that lots of other people in the chat will have the same question undoubtedly. So under the Act, uh, there's some key responsibilities for coaches and managers. Um, and these apply too if it's a teacher in those roles. Um, and the first one's around taking reasonable practical steps to ensure their own safety and others. And it's key here that there's no, it's no action or inaction. So it's both doing something or not doing it that is important here. They also need to understand 
that they need to follow the school's reasonable instruction and they need to know what the, that is. And they need to cooperate with any reasonable policy and procedure. So this is where it's really important that there's a good flow of information to those, the people holding those roles. So they really understand what the school expects and are able to um, meet their responsibilities to, to cooperate with that. The Board of Trustees um, clearly have a role in this and responsibilities under the Act. Their responsibilities are around needing to know what the big picture is of what's happening. Uh, so not the nitty gritty detail, but the big picture. So um, you know, we've got so many sports exchanges, we've got um, students going to these tournaments during the year, we're going to winter tournament and summer tournament, you might give them an idea of the number of students that are involved or the codes that might be going. Um, and then we will have school teams in these ongoing competitions. The other part of their responsibility is needing to understand what systems are in place to manage the safety of everyone involved in that big picture. So students, staff and the volunteers. And they also need to understand how it works in with the overall EOTC system um, within the school. Any questions at this stage? Okay, can't see anything in the chat. Um, so a little bit on safety checking and vetting because uh, there's a number of these questions that come across my desk. Um, so where coaches and managers are volunteers, uh, it is a school decision about whether uh, they, or the school vets uh, and safety checks those people. Um, it's not a requirement under either uh, the Children's Act or the Education Act. And schools are often guided here um, by the level of access um, those coaches or managers um, have to those students. Um, and schools seem to uh, look to be police vetting and safety checking coaches and managers where they have regular access um, to students uh, without uh, teachers being there or a whole bunch of parents being there if they're taking students away on um, tournament weeks that type of level of access um, trainings uh, after school or in the evenings or early mornings um, but it's a school decision at, at board level about um, what level of checking and vetting um, schools are comfortable with for volunteers uh, some of you might have coaches or managers who aren't teaching staff, but are paid for that role. Um, so they fall into a different category. Um, they will very likely need to be safety checked, which includes police vetting. Um, so if you've got people sitting in those roles, then you'd need to check with your school's child protection policy. And actually checking with your child protection policy is a good thing to do anyway, just to make sure that it's actually meeting um, your or matches your practice um, and that those practice and the policy are synced. Any questions on police vetting and safety checking? Hi Fiona, Andy speaking. Hi Andy. I've, I've got a couple of questions but they're not from just this page, they're from a little while ago. Um, whereabouts do we find the forms? The form four you've mentioned. Ah, I'll show you exactly where on the EONS website at the okay. end. Okay, good. Cool. Question. Thank you. Thank you. And the other question is um, Do you feel it's necessary for EOTC forms to be generated and all this process to be followed if you've got teams having home games? Other teams are coming to our school and playing after school and things. So the form that we've talked about so far, which is the um, 
one you're using to get information off your coaches, that's kind of an overarching form. So it probably yep. doesn't matter where you are. Um, we'll get down to looking at uh, um, standard operating procedures. Okay. Again, that's more about when you're leaving your school grounds, although a bunch of that stuff will be, that's captured in that form will be relevant when you're playing on your school. Okay. Grounds. One of the reasons I asked the question is we're, we're in quite a remote location and it's quite a big deal for games to happen after school because students travel quite a vast distance to go by bus some you know, quite quite major distances and um so i guess it's the question around um i know we have we have procedures in place for ensuring that parents are available to come and collect the students of course but um yeah i guess because it's happening outside school time the school empties out of staff yeah. um so yeah i'd never really considered that we'd have to fill in those sort of um, forms but it could be that we do yeah, I think a couple of things might become clearer as we go through. Okay, thank you. Uh, because it's definitely, uh, when you're talking about um, local and regular sporting, it's about putting a package together to support whoever's running that yeah. and ensuring that you've got good information on the students that are participating. And it's really clear uh, for parents what the parameters around that are. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good question. Kia ora Fiona. Um, Kia ora. I'm a bit confused actually. <laughs> where, um, I guess I'm involved, well, I'm a DP at a school, but I'm also involved with a club and Sports New Zealand have brought quite a hefty document out this year recommending, you know, because sometimes it's clubs that run a sport within a school and they kind of recommend that people are police checked so I guess where <laughs> you know yeah. where do we sit? <laughs> well also the school um, trustees association recommend that uh, volunteers are safety checked and police vetted uh, but it is a school decision. Um, it, it's not legislated anywhere that volunteers need to be. So it really is the, the level of comfort your school has with who those people are. Um, and for some schools, um, they're in a really small community. Um, police vetting would be seen as a, a step too far. They've got other procedures wrapped around making sure those people are appropriate in their school. Um, for big schools where you're getting um, volunteers in from all over the place. Uh, there's, um, they might have a different approach to that, but basically it's, it's looking at um, the comfort the school has with who's coming in, what other procedures you have wrapped around uh, sport and, and whether and the level of access those people have to students. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Good questions, thank you. Um, so moving on to look at consent and information. So if we think about weekly competitions, so those things that are happen, happening regularly, and um, often this is locally as well, uh, so these could be the competitions that are being run on your school grounds um, for some of those schools. Really what you want to do um, is have some sort of consent form that covers the season. So you, you're just doing it once. Um, and you can use um, Form 7, which is a blanket EOTC consent form, and modify that to work for uh, the sport. Uh, so you would just be getting one lot of consent for, uh, for example, the entire Friday night basketball season for that team. Um, and I can flick now and just, we can have a quick look at that form. So again, this is out of the EOTC toolkit and it's a start. 
um, that helps you think about what would go in a blanket consent or a consent form that covered an activity that happens over a range of time. And lots of this top uh, text here would be changed. Um, you pop the sport title in here, you could put exactly uh, when the activity is running. So terms two and three, Friday basketball, uh, games will be between 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. Um, you can drop information in here uh, around, um, it is the expectation that parents will uh, drive or deliver their students to the games uh, and pick them up at the end. School has no responsibility for um, transporting students to and from this activity. Um, for example, um, obviously when you scroll, scroll down through here, this whole sections that you would take out, uh, medical um, consent is, is probably okay to leave in there. You might have a standard little um, student contract when they are participating in school sport that you want to drop into there. And then um, the parental bit too, just being really clear about whose responsibilities are what. And you can change all of these things in here that refer to EOTC events um, into the particular sporting event. Uh, one that's quite good to, um, or could be quite good to drop into here uh, for the parents um, is around appropriate uh, sideline behavior for sports. And Sport NZ have got some good resources um, around balance is better and appropriate sideline behavior. And you know, if you notice that that's an issue um, around some school sports that uh, you're involved in, then this is quite a good place to drop it into and if it becomes an issue, then you've got something to point back to. Um, you, know, you agreed not to behave like this um, in that part. Uh, so that's another form that can just help with getting consent for a whole block of sport um, activity from the parent. Okay. Sorry, I'll go back one. Sorry, Fiona, may I just ask a question about the blanket consent? Yeah, absolutely. I'm at um, Rangatoto College and I'm just interested because we have a lot of students who share rides or the coaches there at the end and it's probably similar to a lot of other people and there's a child left, I can give you a left home. Is it somewhere in there that we could put about transport as well in that blanket consent? I'm, I'm really aware of you know, another parent taking another child home and there's nothing that's been written as consent. It might be just a text on the night and it's quite haphazard is what I will say. And I'm, it worries me a little bit. Yeah. And I think I've got a transport slide coming up, but I think- Oh, okay. You're, no, no, you're spot on. And that would be one of the places you could put um, that in for sure. And mm. just around making sure everyone's clear on what the expectations are. Mm. So that because it could be the parent says that they will let someone know if they're getting a lift with somebody else. It could be as simple as that, couldn't it? It doesn't have to be ticked off that it's the same person each week. No, no, absolutely. Okay. Um, that's fine. It's just really that there's no surprises. Yeah. Uh, so someone's student doesn't arrive at their, you know, home at their front door and the parent goes, oh, but so-and-so is meant to be bringing you or I would mm. never have let you in that car. Yeah, um, I was coming to get concern. those yeah. types of things. So yeah. setting it up so there's clear expectations that either uh, the school has some responsibility for transport or they don't. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, and the other place to, um, to really emphasize that is in, the, in an information letter that goes home at the start of the season as well. So um, in there... Um, Transport's important, but also information around um, particularly emergency procedures. So we've had a few good examples of those, both natural disasters and school lockdowns. And just being really clear, you know, um, a lot of these things will be after school, but what's your plan if 
all of a sudden the school's in lockdown or there's some sort of natural disaster. Um, who's, who would notify them? Would they um, be expected to go to the pick up at the um, venue or would they expect to come to school? Just really sort of clarifying. Um, not every outcome, obviously, but kind of the main, this is what we're planning. Might not, might not work out that way, but you know, this is our plan at the moment. Um, another thing that's really good to have in that uh, parental letter, and again, it's no surprises, um, really good to emphasize if they don't have particular safety equipment that they need, they won't go onto the field um, so that you don't get uh, a whole lot of parental complaints when they um, find out that their student hasn't, their child hasn't played because they didn't have their mouth guard, for example, or they didn't have their shin guards. Um, and that's another sort of example too of where it's really clear or it's really good to make sure it's clear for the coaches what the school's expectations are around safety equipment and students wearing it. Um, because it's a risk area for school if um, suddenly Bob's had his, all, his front teeth knocked out and the parent is going, well, why didn't he have his mouth guard in? Um, so something to make sure that the coach is clear on your expectations and the parents are clear on your expectations. There. Uh, so here's transport. I think we've probably covered that now. Um, around just being clear really, because um, weekend sport is another um, classic example where um, you want to make sure uh, that you know, Saturday sport, the school has no role in getting the students to the game or in most cases, delivering them home after the game. So that's either, um, you can make it so that's completely up to parents to sort out amongst themselves, but you just need to be really clear that that's your expectation. Um, and also that when students are going to be released um, to go straight home from a venue as well, so that there's no surprises for parents. So one way I think, and a number of you will already be doing this, um, is putting together a package of support material for your coaches and managers. And this supports them for the whole of the time they're working with that particular team. So it's not something that they're refreshing every um, week necessarily, although some things will need to go back and forth with the sports coordinator. Well, it's likely to be the sports coordinator. So going through your EOTC policies and procedures and pulling out one page at the max, I'd say, um, the real need to knows from your EOTC policies and procedures. What are the key expectations that you would be expecting of anyone representing your school um, and that they are required to do to meet those policies and procedures? Because what you don't want is your policies and procedures saying one thing and your coaches, managers, or teaching staff out there doing something completely different. So those, those two things have to match. Also in that package, um, whether that package is electronic or a clear file, you know, there's all sorts of options. And some really clear incident management instructions, uh, a system of first aid recording, both the first aid they may give um, to a student, you know, who it is, what happened, um, and what they, um, what first aid was given, but also a little system that they can bring back to the sports coordinator and say, I used uh, the triangular bandage and four band-aids so that there's a, a way of keeping the first aid um, current. Standard operating procedures, and we'll flick out of this slide into an example of standard operating procedures in a second. Uh, and then the medical information for the participants um, and any other volunteers that are helping them. And that's the, the details that are relevant um, for that coach or manager to know. Um, and in your letter to parents or the consent and in the consent form, it's 
it's important to emphasize, and it is in the consent form, that it's the parents', parents responsibility to make sure that information is, medical information is up to date. And um, during, you know, if it changes during the season. Um, so that's really important. So if we just have a look at a standard operating procedure. So this is a way, and this is form three um, out of the toolkit, and I've just started creating one for, a, for sport. And it's very general, um, and you can um, adapt it to meet both your school needs and that particular sports needs. Um, you'll find that across codes, um, a lot of the stuff really does stay the same. And so this can be a very efficient way to capture um, how you manage safety um, across sports. Um, and here we're talking really about the um, weekly sports. Uh, you might need a little bit more um, than this if you're go running a sports exchange, uh, going off to a national tournament for the week, winter tournament, etc. Uh, so this has got some standard sections, some things to, um, for the coach to pick up before they leave or make sure they have with them. Uh, it's got two options for what the school expects about signing out um, from school. Uh, and schools will have um, different things that they, or ways they like to manage that. And ways that are um, practical. So for this Wednesday sport one, uh, the school that this was developed for was a, a slightly removed from town school. So everyone bus to Wednesday sport. The sports coordinator was in the bus bay. Each bus left, um, but before it left, the, um, the coach or manager arrived to the sports coordinator, handed them the list of students they had with them and signed out. So it's making um, it match uh, what happens within the school. Uh, here it's got some major hazards for the coach or manager to think about. And then it's got standard requirements. So these are the things that you would expect the coach or manager to do every time or have with them or tell the students every time they go off to that. Uh, Friday night basketball, for example. And a lot of these will be the same across all of your sports um, that run on a weekly basis and uh, need to be modified for the age of the student you're dealing with, um, the location you're going, and the expectations of your school. Also, inside, outside, winter, summer. Um, there's a little list here of equipment that the coach or manager would have with them and that the uh, student might have with them. And then this bit is particular and the blue writing would change depending on the team. It might also change depending on if you're going to a different location um, or if you suddenly got a different uh, set of staff with you because you're thinking about the particular participant and their needs. So in this case, Bob's allergic to wasps. Um, this is obviously an outside sports activity. Uh, so uh, someone here is being designated to check that uh, Bob's got his EpiPen with him as you get on the, in the school van to go. Um, and there's a little thing here about the location. So this really brings it from really general expectations down to particular things uh, for that um, team. But in saying that, those things will mainly stay the same during that season. Uh, just an example, you might drop in a, a map 
So this isn't one related to sport particularly, but if it was, it would have a maul here with a big red cross through it. And then down the bottom here, we've got what needs to happen when you get back to school. So that's an example of a standard operating procedure. That can be very useful for making sure there's a good standard process happening across all of your sports coaches and managers with what they're doing out there on the day. Any questions at this stage? anything uh, there's one in the chat from we've discussed this form and view it as a as being blanket consent to cover what we call local yep environs yes yep uh, and I I presume Peter are you talking about the blanket consent form that we looked at yep um Basically, uh, again, we're a fairly rare uh, rural school, yeah. um, and we do use the local environment, our domain, and uh, rugby grounds and so on for a number of activities, as well as going into the township. And rather than having to complete um, documentation every time, um, at the beginning of the year, we have something that we currently call the uh, blanket consent form, um, but it's not not your uh, form seven. So I'm just assuming that that form seven cat could be used for that. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. yep. And Good. you could, for um, very localized sport, you could decide that blanket consent um, that you get at the start of the year uh, could cover that um, local sport as well. You yeah. just need to be explicit about that in the blanket consent form that goes yeah. out at the start of the year. Yeah, I mean, for instance, we've just had our cross country this afternoon. Um, we, I, 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 as the EOTC, I didn't have any um, documentation done for it simply uh, because, you know, it is our local environment. Um, the kids have been practicing it for the last um, week and a half, so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and that's more of a school activity in yeah. school time. Um, so fine. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Uh, so just a little bit, um, some things that can help uh, sports coordinator record keeping. Uh, some sort of uh, tracking system for the first aid kits and the supplies. Some sort of Excel sheet is a pretty good, good start, but a way of tracking um, that first aid kits have been checked and that their supplies are up to date um, and who did it and when that happened. Uh, a, a similar thing about keeping a track on uh, sports safety equipment that the, sport, that the school provides. And that's the key thing that this is school provided safety equipment and it, whether it's a checklist or a spreadsheet um, that tracks anything that would be considered um, personal protective equipment. And that's stuff that a school is providing, not the um, equipment that a student might bring. So examples, if the school provides the goalie gear for soccer or the shin pads for the soccer team, um, then a record of when that was purchased, that it's been checked every season, um, needs to be kept. And the same applies for um, safety equipment like the post padding. So just a, a spreadsheet that's tracking that gear and that it's being checked as still being um, fit for purpose for keeping whoever's using it safe. And the last thing I've popped up here is a database for the coaches and managers. And again, it can be as simple as an Excel sheet but a way of recording uh, against each coach and manager uh, all of the information that might be useful to track. Um, so you're not asking the same questions of your coaches and managers all of the time. 
and you're also tracking um, their history with you. Um, and you can check off and keep an eye on expiry dates for first aid certificates if they've got them or their driver's licenses, um, which sometimes sneak up on people. So uh, just a wee thing here. This is if you jump into our, our homepage, um, you can follow this button through to the EOTC coordinator database to register. And up on the top tab, the EOTC management is where you want to head for a whole bunch of information we've talked about today. If, we, if you're in that tab, uh, you will find the EOTC Zoom management series here. So it's got all of the old recordings and the uh, ones coming up. The next Zoom coming up is on the EOTC guidelines review and both the guidelines and also the EOTC uh, safety management template and the toolkit that some of these forms come out of are being reviewed over this year. Um, so for the next session, I'm really keen to uh, get people's ideas on uh, the good, bad and the ugly out of that set of support material. Um, so that we can consider those things when we're making recommendations to uh, either add more information in there to support you, develop new tools, um, or take stuff out that doesn't make sense. Uh, and in here, um, this is the place here to go for where it says EOTC SMP template and toolkits. That will take you um, and link you into the forms that we've looked at today. Um, and there's lots of other forms in there, um, 18 forms at the moment. Um, if you haven't had a look through there, it's, it's great to go in and look and compare um, what you're using to support EOTC and sport in your school with what's there at the moment. Okay. Uh, And that's it for today. Um, questions, if there's any uh, further questions, is, now's the time. Yes, uh, I've got a question again, Fiona. Okay. Um, when it comes to actually, you know, being an area school, we do a lot of um, sporting activities with the other area schools sort of in, in our area. Um, you know, that's sort of up to 50 to 70 kilometers or more away in some cases. Yep. Um, when they are looking at doing the risk assessment uh, for that, do they really need to go through and complete uh, that eight page form two every single time? Or is there a simpler form that they can be using? Now, this is where I think standard operating procedures are really good. And um, there's a whole Zoom on using standard operating procedures. So that involves going through that uh, risk assessment process um, once with um, an expert group, you might say, and then taking the things that you've identified during that process off that form and putting them on a standard operating procedure form. Okay. And then that's the one that you use um, going ahead in time. You need to review it. And every time you go, you need to change that, the, the text yes. that was in blue to make yep. it work for that group and where you're going that particular day. But you've already done all of the other thinking. And as long as, um, staff are engaging, reading that form, um, it's a really good way to go. For okay. those activities that, even though 80Ks might seem like a long way, for you it's local and yep. um, you're doing it regularly. Mm. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? got uh, one comment down here around school bridge um, and yes your forms are all electronic and they are exactly the same forms as if you follow the eons link um, and those forms once they've been reviewed in this um, process this year 
um, will change on school bridge as well. All right. If there's no other questions, I'll say goodbye for um, this week and hopefully see you uh, next month at the next one. Thanks everyone for coming along.